Uh, welcome to General Conference Conversations, the podcast where we have conversations about General Conference. I'm your host, Kaylin, and I'm super excited to be here with you, studying the words of our living prophets, apostles, and chosen leaders. I've loved listening to podcasts about Come Follow Me, and I saw a need for a podcast centered around the General Conference talks. Um, I'm not a scholar, I'm not an expert, I'm a 20-something who just simply adores the gospel. The things I discuss are my opinions. Um, as one of my favorite podcasts, at last she said it often says, your mileage may vary. In addition to my connections and thoughts, I will include a list of questions at the end of every episode as a place to start with your own deeper study of each talk. And I hope this podcast will be a jumping off point as you apply these principles to your life. In that spirit, I invite you to read and study today's talk before listening to this episode. Listen for what the Lord is saying to you personally. Then come join me for a beautiful discussion together. Hello, hello. I'm back. We are back. And we are officially on the last session of conference today. Very first talk from the last session of conference. Which is so crazy. <clears throat> which also means that we only have like four weeks until conference, which is also crazy. So, what the heck. Um, happy September. I can't remember if it was actually September when I posted my last episode. Well, if I didn't say happy September, happy September. Um, super excited to be back. I'm not as excited about this talk. This talk was a doozy for me. It was really hard to listen to during conference, and I'll get into why. Um, And it was a little bit hard to reread as well. Um, Just frustrating, but there are some good things in it, of course, as always. So um, today's talk is um, Elder Present Oaks is from the Sunday afternoon session. Divine Love in the fa- in the Father's Plan. Um, and as always, I excuse me, encourage you to read or listen to this talk before um, you come and listen to the episode. But I'm going to jump right in. So his, of course, as the title suggests, is about love. And love in uh, the plan of salvation specifically. Um, and so his kind of his thesis is he says what I say here seeks to clarify how God's love explains that doctrine and the church's inspired policies so he's talking about um, basically why the church does what it does why um, certain policies are in place what certain doctrine, you know, seeks to, to do for us, um, which I thought was really interesting to talk about, I guess. The first quote I wanted to read, says, I love you, my brothers and sisters. I love all of God's children. When Jesus was asked, which is the great commandment in the law, <clears throat> he taught that to love God and to love our neighbors are the first of God's great commandments. Those commands are first because they invite us to grow spiritually by seeking to imitate God's love for us. And so I wanted to ask as my first kind of question is, have you pondered deeply the role in the plan of salvation? Like, think about that. What truly is the role of love in the plan of salvation? Um, And I've thought about this a lot. Um, You know, studying Christ's life. Um, trying to be like him, setting conference this this year as as so much of it has been about the atonement and you know why the atonement happened and the purpose of the atonement um, and that it's because God loves us and that 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 was part of his plan like he he loves us so much he wants all of us to come back to him. And the atonement is <clears throat> the way to do that if we if if we if we choose to follow him. And so, um, 
and of course right the commands that Christ commandments that Christ always talked about um to love God and to love our neighbors and I love that that the first commands are first because they invite us to grow spiritually by seeking to imitate God's love for us and I wanted to read you this quote that my friend sent me last night um last night the night before might have been the night before oh no it was last night no it was Sunday Sunday night (laughs) um and she found out what she was studying by Robert J. Wetton. And um, I think uh, she said it to me. I don't know where she found it, but she sent it to me. And as I was reading the talk today, I was like, mm, this fits really well. He says, every unselfish act of kindness and service increases your spirituality. God would use you to bless others. Their continued spirit, your sorry, your continued spiritual growth and eternal progress are very much wrapped up in your relationships and how you treat others. Do you indeed love others and become a blessing in their lives? Isn't the measure of the level of your conversion how you treat others? The person who does not, who does only those things in the church that concern himself alone, will never reach the goal of perfection. Service to others is what the gospel and exalted life are all about. And I just love that because I was like, that's, that's the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? That, and I've talked about this on here before, as we've talked about the atonement, as we talked about conversion, as we've talked about, um, you know, our commandments and just so many things. And... That that is the true measure of our conversion, is how we treat others, is how we, you know, become like Christ by treating others the way he would treat them. And it can be really hard, and it can be really, you know, sucky to, (laughs) um, to love people who don't love you, or who are, you know, have hurt you in some way but but that is the basis of the whole plan of salvation is love and I don't think we talk about that enough so I really love that he, he this is a kind of the whole like basis of his talk so he goes on to talk about the three kingdoms of glory um and he says a loving heavenly father has a better plan for his children so he, t- he talks about like heaven and hell um He says, a loving Heavenly Father has a better plan for his children. The revealed doctrine of the restored Church of Jesus Christ teaches that all the children of God, with exceptions too limited to consider here, will finally wind up in a kingdom of glory. And I love that he he talks about this doctrine on the basis of love. Because often, and I think I've talked about this before (coughs) on here, but often I think we look at the three kingdoms of glory as just another way to judge people. (laughs) Um, That we focus so much on the celestial kingdom that the celestial kingdom kind of becomes heaven and the other kingdoms kind of become hell in our minds. That, you know, it's going to be the absolute end of the world if you end up in the celestial kingdom or the terrestrial kingdom. Um... And I love how he talks about the celestial kingdom in here. Is he does emphasize it. He's like, we don't know a whole lot about the other two kingdoms of glory. And we know a lot about the celestial kingdom. Because that's where God wants us to be. Because God loves us and he wants us to be with him. And um, that's the emphasis I think we should put on the celestial kingdom. Not, you have to go to the celestial kingdom. Or, you know you're not going to be with your family forever, you'll never see your family again. Like, we use this kind of fear instead of the love. We use a fear of, you know, making it into the lowest kingdom as, you know, the worst thing you could possibly do. Or, oh, if you leave the church, then you're not going to go into the celestial kingdom. Oh, if you don't get married, you're not going to get exalted. And we use it as a fear, as a fear of eternity. 
as this like life and death and you know eternal consequences for your actions and which of course we know obviously like there are eternal consequences for our actions but there's also eternity to continue to progress and you know love and be better and we don't talk about eternal progression enough I don't think (laughs) um of like that it shouldn't be a, it's not a punishment eternity is not a punishment it's an opportunity um and that like god loves us so much that he actually made three separate degrees of glory you know places that are so glorious we can't even imagine them even the celestial kingdom the lowest of the three right it's supposed to be more glorious than, you know, human comprehension. And, um, and I think we use that to be like, well, if that's the case, then can't you just imagine what the celestial kingdom is, is going to be like? And absolutely, definitely. Um, but also, like, can you, can you believe that? Can you imagine a God so loving that he's, he's prepared three kingdoms of glory for all of his children even the ones who don't accept him even the ones who don't choose not to live in his presence right um and that's amazing anyway so so he talks about the celestial glory he talks about the three degrees or levels of the celestial kingdom And he says, to help us develop the godly attributes and the change in nature necessary to realize our divine potential, the Lord has revealed doctrine and established commandments based on eternal law. This is what we teach in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, because the purpose of the doctrine and principles of this restored church is to prepare God's children for salvation in the celestial glory and, more particularly, for exaltation in its highest degree. So, um... He quotes um, President Nelson a little bit later about this as well, that like salvation is an individual matter and exaltation is a family matter. That part of our doctrine is that getting into the highest degree of celestial glory, um, you must be married in the, cel- in the temple, uh, sealed in the temple. And so, so he's kind of like talking about, he's like, well, you know, our goal is the highest level of the celestial kingdom. And so because of that, as a church, we put emphasis on temples and building temples and ceilings and um, families. That's kind of what he goes through throughout this talk. Um, it's kind of an explanation for, you know, why we kind of do what we do. Um So, so he kind of talks about, um, says the teachings and policies of the Lord's restored church apply these eternal truths in a way that we, that can be fully understood only in the context of our Heavenly Father's loving plan for all of his children. Thus we honor individual agency. Most are aware of its, of this church's great efforts to promote religious freedom. These efforts are in furtherance of our Heavenly Father's plan. We seek to help all of his children, not just our own members, enjoy the precious freedom to choose. Remember that as we go a bit later. Um, And then he talks about, he's like, we are also sometimes asked why we send missionaries and why we do such big humanitarian aid that's not linked to missionary work. Um, I know some some churches who will you know give out um the, like soup kitchens or whatever with the caveat that you have to go to their church service or you know yada 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 right or it's their missionary is always doing this the service it's always you know linked to that um 
He says, we do, we do this because the Lord has taught us to esteem all of his children as our brothers and sisters, and we want to share our spiritual and temporal abundance with everyone. So, and I love that. I love that doctrine. We've, ta- we've talked about that. We talked about that just recently. Um... With, I can't remember what talk it was now, but um, you know that we are we are supposed to treat others as God's children because that's that's they are God's children. Um, literally, love God and love your neighbors, right? And those two things are so interconnected that if you're loving God, you should be loving your neighbors, and if you're loving your neighbors, you're loving God. Um, and so I love that we as a church do things, um, some things without the ulterior motive of, you know, just converting everyone that we truly do just, we donate and we help and we, um, provide aid. So this next section (laughs) is the part that's hard for me and there are weren't a whole lot of things that I under or highlighted because just the whole section um, is a lot. So it's when you're talking about families and why we're a family centered church, right? Um, that those eternal relationships are what lead to exaltation, right? That um, that to be in that highest degree of celestial glory, you have to be married in the temple and sell to your family. So, of course, he brings up the family proclamation to the world, and he brings up LGBTQ things, and he brings up Satan's attacks on the family. And... I've talked about this before a few times in passing. I have a huge passion for LGBTQ rights. And it's something in our church policies and practices um, that's really hard for me. And I've talked to God about it a lot. A lot, a lot. Um, And it's an ongoing, you know, question that I have for him. And what bugged me about this talk he didn't say anything new and so it wasn't like it's anything worse or it's anything better or anything like that right he didn't say anything new and that's what bugged me (laughs) that you know we know we know what the the church's stance on this subject is uh, we've read the family proclamation to the world. It's been reinstated, restated all the time, over and over, since 1995 when it came out, right? For 27 years. And especially recently, there have been a lot of things going on in the church um, having to do with LGBTQ community and um, it just felt like this was just a reinstatement of well remember we don't support that because of this and it almost felt like this whole talk was like this leading up to this one section like the climax of his talk being like so, because God loves everyone, you know, because he loves his children, and because he wants them to be married and, you know, to be in the highest degree of the kingdom of glory, you know, and, and that means you have to be married, then that's why we don't support gay marriage. And it felt very patronizing. <laughs> and, um, and I'm not even a part of that community, and it felt very patronizing. Um... 
And it's, it's just the same rhetoric that we've heard for 27 years. That there's attacks on the family, the family is being torn apart, and it almost always includes, and sometimes is the only thing that we talk about, is gay marriage. And transgender rights. And all of that stuff. And I really don't like talking about politics on this podcast, because this should be about, you know, general conference conversations. But this was come first about a general conference today, this this year, so I'm going to talk about it. So, <clears throat> one thing that I did highlight was, um, you know, of course, he talks about Satan's attacks on the family and his opposition to the family which is almost always then relayed back to, like, gay marriage and things like that. He talks about, consequently, he seeks to, he being Satan, seeks to oppose progress toward exaltation by distorting marriage, discouraging childbearing, or confusing gender. And those are the only three things that he lists. And of course, I know that he can't list all of the ways that Satan deceives us about this particular thing but it's no coincidence obviously because he's been talking about like gay marriage and same-sex marriage and things like that throughout this talk uh, throughout the section the other three things that he brings up are all related to the lgbtq community distorting marriage being you know that it's not only between a man and a woman discouraging childbearing that as, you know, a couple in a gay relationships, you cannot have your own uh, fully biological children between the two of you, right? Like, you can't have your own biological children, um, but it has to be with a surrogate or, like, donors, right? And confusing gender, which, of course, is right up there very clearly about uh, non-binary, transgender, uh, all of that jazz. So, I want to ask this question, and it might be a, a little cheeky, but I want to talk about what else falls in this category of Satan's attacks on the family, because I agree that Satan is attacking the family. Um, t- Satan is attacking relationships um, family relationships because he knows that families are important, that relationships are important, and that if we are alone, um, <clears throat> it's easier for him to get to us, right? To attack our self worth, to attack our identity as a child of God. That if we have relationships with the church, with our ward, with our neighbors, with, um, our families, you know, it's harder for him to get us alone because we have a support system. I personally don't necessarily think that LGBTQ stuff falls in that category. Um, Except that he is using the probably getting a little too far out here <clears throat> so I won't, I'll, I'll back off but so the other things that I think about all the time <clears throat> what else splits up families divorce rates and what contributes to divorce is a lot of things <laughs> um, mental health uh, getting married too young or too quickly and not understand the full like ramifications of being married, um, influences on marriage, like, social media, or, you know, just a lot of things, right, like, I'm sure you can go on and on, domestic abuse, uh, child abuse, um, power dynamics between men and women in marriages, and just on and on and on and on and on. Keep going forever and ever. And and so while I 
know that the church is going to continue talking about LGBTQ stuff in this realm, I think it's also important to talk about other ways that Satan is attacking the family. Because if we ignore those ways, he's going to continue doing it. And if we only focus on you know, LGBTQ issues, um, we're just going to hurt people. And we are hurting people. And so I, earlier I read the quote. Um, I'm going to find it. We seek to help all of his children, not just our own members, enjoy the precious freedom to choose. And I think sometimes when we talk about uh, the queer community, it often feels like we're taking away their ch- their option, their freedom to choose. And I know that's not true. I know that the church would be like, oh no, well they're they're free to do that. And they're free to live the life that they want. And yet the way that we talk about things like this, the way that it's talked about over the pulpit in general conference and by general authorities in firesides and whatever, it doesn't feel like that. The actual actions that we take and the things that go on at BYU or in wards and stakes um, don't necessarily reflect that stance. That's all I'll say about that. I also just want to point out, he says, in contrast, so he's talking about the family proclamation, in contrast, oh, he says, those who do not fully understand the father's loving plan for his children may consider this family proclamation no more than a tangible statement of policy. In contrast, we affirm the family proclamation founded on irrevocable doctrine defines the kind of family relationships where the most important part of our eternal development can occur. The family proclamation is hard for me, and not just for LGBTQ stuff. Um, My family, my parents are separated um, and have been for a really long time. Um... And so our family does not look like the family in the family proclamation to the world. And I grew up with uh, my grandparents on both sides of my parents, like both of my parents' parents uh, were divorced. And so I grew up with, you know, knowing that not every family looked like a mom and dad and kids. And, um... these specified, you know, rules of the mother stays home, the dad goes and works, you know, that we kind of glean from that, even though those things can mean very, you know, different things for everybody, um, was also different. My grandma worked, um, because she was a single mother, and my mom worked once we were old enough, uh, she started driving school buses at the school. And she now is working because she's a single mother. And so, um, and I understand that it's a portrait of kind of the idealness, right? The ideal family, the ideal thing. Um, But often the way we talk about the family proclamation can hurt a lot of people and not just LGBTQ people, but people who are in very different family relationships, Um, whether divorce or death or whatever it may be, um, and so I wanted to point out (laughs) that the Family Proclamation, one, has never been accepted into our canon, um, like, if you think about the, the official declarations at the end of Doctrine and Covenants, um, they were sustained in a general conference to be added and included in the Doctrine and Covenants to be canonized into our books of scripture. Um, the Grand Proclamation has never has never done that. We've never done that with that. Um, and with the other proclamations, like the Restoration Proclamation, the Living Christ, um, they've been read aloud in general conference, but they have not been canonized. They've also never referred to the 
Shema Prachamish to the world as doctrine. Even in this sentence that I just said, he says, founded on irrevocable doctrine um, of eternal families and, you know, things like that. <laughs> but he doesn't directly call it doctrine or revelation. Um, I just want to put that out there as something to chew on. So, that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> that's, um, it's just hard um, that, you know, I know people in that community who are members of the church. And people who weren't members, you know, of that community who have loved ones who are members of the queer community like me. Who this talk was really hard for because it was just another, like, well, we've heard all of that. Why do you have to keep saying this? Why do you have to keep, you know, reiterating the same thing over and over? We know. We know, and we know that this is just going to give people more fodder to judge and to um, be homophobic and transphobic and you know, all of this stuff because it comes from the church, right? So, just something to keep in mind. Um, his last section, this talk was actually pretty quick. I I was reading it and I was like, wow, I didn't realize how short this seemed to me. Um, I remember it being longer. But, maybe it's just because Elder Oaks talks very, like, deliberately, and so um, I'm sure the actual talk was a little bit longer than me just reading it. But, um, anyway, so, he says, In many relationships and circumstances in mortal life, each of us must live with differences. As followers of men, we f- we bleh, we should live peacefully with those who do not believe as we do. And... So that's kind of my last question for you. I know I haven't had a whole lot of questions this time around. More just like commentary. But um, this one I loved a lot. Even after, you know, it came after kind of the crazy things before it that I was struggling with. But how can you better live peacefully with those who do not believe as you do? And I think that goes with what we were just talking about. And not just LGBTQ, but like other people who... Um, other religions, people who don't practice any religion, um, people with different political views, people with different opinions on, you know, this, the happenings around the world. Um, how do you live peacefully with them? How do you love them because of their other opinions? Not in spite of, but because of. And because they're children of God. Um, And he says, We must seek to share these truths of eternity with others, but with love, with the love we owe to all of our neighbors, we always accept their decisions. And I know that can be really hard. Um, But (laughs) as we see people as children of God, it can be really easy to say, well, that's that must be what makes them happy. And if that's what makes them happy, then that's what makes me happy because I love them. And we talked about this a few episodes ago. That, like, that doesn't mean, like he says, we must seek to share these truths with each other. Like, that doesn't mean that you don't talk about your beliefs and, you know, defend your way of life. But we can defend our way of life without putting down other people's ways of life as well. So... Anyway, um, God's love is real and um, is the basis for so much that we do and so much that he does for us, or everything that he does for us. And it should be the basis for all that we do, is that God loves us and God loves everyone. That is my testimony. <laughs> that is my TED Talk. Um... <laughs> But let me recap my questions really, really quick. The first one was, of course, um, have you pondered deeply the role of the love and role of love in the plan of salvation? The second was 
about um, Satan's attack on the family. What else falls in this category that we can talk about? Um, that you've noticed have, have pulled apart families um, in your life and your experiences, things like that. And then the last one was, uh, how can you better live peacefully with those who do not believe as you do? This was a heavy talk <laughs> for me, and I, I'm sure it was probably a heavy talk for all of you. Um, but I think it's important to think about these things, to talk about these things, to consider. Um, even things that we hear all the time. And to really think deeply about them and challenge our, our views on them and pray about them and, you know, really talk to God about about things. So, that's all I have for you today. And I will talk to you later this week. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of General Conference Conversations. Be sure to follow and share us on um, any social media. And if you like the show, feel free to leave us a review or tell your friends. Until next time.